We're going to talk about some more uh, hematologic disorders here uh, that affect the newborn. Um, now certainly uh, these aren't the only hematologic disorders that affect the newborn. Um, as you can see here, um, there's a lot of them, but that's not all of them. Uh, there are a lot of disorders that can affect the newborn that also affect the adult uh, that I talk about in, uh, in the heme section. Um, but there are also some uh, that usually come on a little bit later in childhood, um, so I'm not going to address them here uh, when we're particularly talking about the newborn. So here we're going to particularly focus on anemia, uh, particularly red blood cell anemia, and then we'll talk about polycythemia, which is just the opposite. Also, there are some uh, other causes uh, that do affect the newborn that we're not going to talk about here, uh, and that includes RH incompatibility and ABO incompatibility. Uh, I talked about that in the uh, jaundice section. So iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of anemia in the U.S., and the symptoms are going to be just like you'd have in any anemia, pallor, fatigability, irritability, uh, difficulty feeding, uh, generally due to the uh, fatigue, the baby doesn't have the energy to uh, try to eat, to latch, to suck the bottle, and then ultimately that's going to lead to failure to thrive and uh, missing milestones if it's prolonged. Uh, now you would think that iron deficiency anemia or any, def uh, any anemia would be really obvious, baby's pale, baby's tired, but a lot of parents don't necessarily know that, especially if it's their first child. They think babies sleep a lot, and they do, but there's a point where it becomes abnormal. So for diagnosis, uh, for iron deficiency anemia, it's really straightforward. You're getting CBC, and that CBC will show you an anemia and a low hemoglobin. Particularly, it's going to be a microcytic anemia. Uh, which reflects iron deficiency in most cases. There are a few other things that it can be, but iron deficiency is by far the most common when it's microcytic. At iron studies, and the iron studies will show you uh, a low ferritin and a low serum iron, which reflects the low iron stores. Uh, so um, if you get iron studies, which Typically, there's at least these three uh, uh, studies that are done. There's the ferritin, um, then the serum iron, and then the, uh, the TIBC. And the TIBC is going to be high. There's high availability for iron, uh, but there's no iron available. Uh, the ferritin is going to be low because the ferritin, remember, is what transports iron. And since there's no iron, there's no need for ferritin, so that's going to be low. And then, of course, the serum iron is going to be low since you don't have it. Uh, you'll also see, and this is on the CBC, you'll also see an elevated RDW, red cell distribution width. And what that's just telling you is that there are some normal blood cells, a few normal red blood cells, and then there are also some really, really small ones. And uh, that makes this wide width of, of blood cell sizes, whereas in a normal patient, Roughly all red blood cells should be about the same size, and so that red cell distribution width is much smaller. The causes of iron deficiency anemia are lack of iron uh, intake or uh, blood loss, just like in an adult. But when we're talking about an infant, it's a little bit different. So uh, in insufficient dietary intake uh, is going to be uh, different based on how the baby is feeding. So if you have a breastfed patient, breastfed baby, uh, it has to be remembered that breast milk is low in iron. It doesn't actually have enough iron uh, for the baby uh, to thrive. And so all breastfed babies are going to need to get supplemental oral iron beginning at four months of age. Until four months of age, the baby has enough iron reserves uh, still from fetal life. Uh, to uh, make red blood cells, but starting at four months of age, the baby is going to start to need oral iron, uh, and those are usually just given as drops, and that's going to continue until the baby is able to eat iron-fortified cereals or other foods that have iron. And that, of course, is going to be based on milestones, when a baby can start eating solid foods uh, or cereals, usually when the baby is able to spit stuff out of their mouth when they're, be, when they're able to hold their head up, uh, sit up without support, things like that. Babies who are formula fed typically uh, don't need any iron supplementation uh, because most formulas are iron fortified. Uh, however, if for some reason uh, the parent is using a formula that's not iron fortified, 
for instance, if it's a formula that's uh, made for older children, uh, then in that case, uh, you can uh, run into a deficiency of iron. And then finally, if the baby is premature, all premature babies need to get twice the amount of oral iron, actually starting uh, a little bit earlier on at about one month of age. Um, and I, if they're, uh, if, if they're uh, breastfeeding. So, uh, so let's just restate that. So all premature babies need two milligrams per kg of supplemental oral iron until an iron formula is started, iron for fortified formula is started, or if they're breastfeeding until fortified cereals uh, can be started. So in other words, uh, what this means is that if the baby's going to breastfeed, they're going to need extra supplemental iron. If the baby's going to formula feed, they're going to need a special formula for premature babies that have extra iron in it. And so uh, if the baby is, if this is a premature baby and the parents are giving the baby a formula that's for term infants that only has one milligram per kilogram, uh, then in that case you can run into an insufficient intake. And then finally, some other uh, ways are blood loss. Uh, cow's milk use, that's a really common mistake that parents make uh, that can lead to occult blood loss, and then lead poisoning. The management of this is just going to be a formal diagnosis. Uh, patient education is really important uh, regarding the proper dietary requirements. One milligram per kilogram for a term infant, two milligrams per kilogram for a uh, preterm infant. And then you'll want to follow this baby up in about a month with a finger stick hemoglobin check uh, to make sure that the uh, hemoglobin levels have increased. And if this continues despite, uh, despite management, despite giving the baby appropriate amounts of iron, you can do a lead screening. And that's actually, in most states, that's, uh, that's part of just general preventative management. And uh, the state health authorities designate specific locations that are at high risk for uh, lead intoxication. And furthermore, all babies should be screened for anemia at one year of age, no matter what. So this is uh, the recommended amount of iron per day based on age. So here is a formula that can be given for formula feeding babies. Uh, this would be for term infants, it appears, since the preterm formulas will say preterm on them or premature babies. Um, and so uh, this would be all the baby needs. So you're getting the baby's nutrition and the iron all in one. Now if the baby's breastfeeding, and breastfeeding is always superior to formula feeding if possible, then the baby will need an extra supplementation since the breast milk doesn't have enough iron itself. And so uh, the baby can be given uh, the iron in the drops here, and it will tell the mother how much to, uh, to give the baby. And like I said, that started at four months of age, and it's continued until the baby can eat iron-fortified cereals or other foods containing iron. Um, so this would be uh, aforementioned cereals uh, that have the iron in them. Uh, once you start a baby on that, then you don't no longer need to give them supplemental iron because they're getting it through their diet. Um, and then uh, as they get older, they can eat uh, foods like meat and dairy and beans and various vegetables uh, that uh, have iron as well. Okay, so uh, let's talk about an anemia that's very specific to babies. So this is a physiologic anemia of infancy. And as you can tell by its name, it is not a disease. Uh, however, it's a process that you should be aware of uh, from a physiologic perspective and because in some babies who have other uh, concurrent anemias, particularly hemolytic anemias, this process can actually be pronounced to where it would cause symptoms. So basically what happens is within the first week of life, as the baby is breathing now, which they weren't doing when they were in the womb, there's going to be a drop in hemoglobin because the baby has more oxygen available. And so the body's response is, okay, I've got this oxygen. I don't need to produce red blood cells at the way I was producing them. And so because of that increased oxygen availability, the response is going to be a reduced uh, EPO or erythropoietin. And that reduced erythropoietin is going to reduce hematopoiesis. But the problem is 
the result is uh, is that the red blood cell degradation is a little bit faster than the the, the baby's hematopoiesis because remember that fetal red blood cells uh, have a, sh a shorter life than adult red blood cells. And so there will be a, 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 a drop in uh, the hemoglobin. So this will result in a lower hemoglobin concentration. The result of this is going to be a reduced oxygen supply. But that oxygen supply doesn't really ever sink below the oxygen demand. Once the oxygen supply gets to about the point of demand or slightly passes it, uh, then the erythropoietin uh, will rise again and stimulate hematopoiesis. And that usually occurs around 8 to 12 weeks uh, in the term baby. So this is typically nothing that causes symptoms. All it is is a physiologic response. The hemoglobin drops because the baby's breathing now. Some of those fetal red blood cells are being purged out and the fetal red blood cells uh, don't stay around as long as uh, the adult red blood cells uh, are created. Uh, and so uh, the result of that is just a usually subclinical drop in hemoglobin. Now, where this actually becomes a problem is in babies who have coexisting hemolytic anemias, so things like sickle cell disease or RH incompatibility, uh, it can be exacerbated, it can exacerbate the anemia that would already be there and make that anemia worse, and that can lead to symptoms. Also, in preterm babies, this drop, this whole process, it occurs quicker, and the drop is more severe. And so that uh, severity can lead to symptoms as well. Um, and also because the, uh, the response, uh, making the red blood cells, it's going to take a little bit longer um, just due to the, uh, the erythropoietin response and making the red blood cells. And so the recovery phase is going to take a little bit longer. So in preterm babies, this physiologic anemia of infancy uh, can often uh, cause a, a symptomatic anemia. If anemic symptoms are present, uh, you can do red blood cell transfusion. Uh, but just having anemia on the chart with no symptoms is not uh, necessarily an indication to give red blood cells. It's really if the anemic, uh, anemic symptoms are present. Okay, so this is something different. This is actually pathological. So this is called transient erythroblastopenia of childhood, or TEC, T-E-C. And this is the most common acquired red cell anemia in pediatrics. So we're going to talk about a couple more anemias that are congenital, uh, that you're born with, but this is acquired, and it typically occurs between six months and three years of age, but it's been, it's actually uh, been documented that it's even happened in an 18-year-old, so it's like uh, erythroblast erythroblastopenia of an adult, uh, but it can, ha it typically happens between six months and three years of age. Uh, and commonly it follows a viral infection, but we don't really know specifically what virus is more associated with tech. So that's just uh, sort of a pearl. It's like come after a viral infection, but it may be an asymptomatic viral infection. Um, we don't really know, but we do know that it does commonly follow a viral infection. The symptoms are just anemic symptoms. So pallor, fatigability, feeding difficulties, irritability. Your workup, whenever you have a baby that you believe to be anemic, should always start with a CBC. And this uh, tech is going to show moderate to severe normoblastic anemia. So that stands in contrast to iron deficiency anemia, where you had a microcytic anemia. Here you have a normoblastic anemia. The red blood cells are normal in size. There's just fewer of them. There can also be a neutropenia or a thrombosis. And the reason, for, uh, sorry, thrombocytosis, not a thrombosis, thrombocytosis. And the reason uh, that can happen is because as the red blood cell count drops, as the hemoglobin level drops, uh, what happens is your erythropoietin level goes up. And erythropoietin can have some uh, thrombo, uh, uh, thrombo creative effects. It, it, it shares some homology with uh, with TPO, which is what uh, what makes what helps make uh, uh, thrombocytes. So um, that's why you may see thrombocytosis in tech. 
Um, if you see sideroblasts, you should consider an alternative diagnosis like lead poisoning. Uh, now, the serum ADA is going to be really important for uh, diagnosing this. So, so we've got our moderate to severe normoblastic anemia. Fine. A serum ADA is really important because what the serum ADA is going to distinguish is whether or not this is something that's going on in the bone marrow, uh, something more congenital, or if this is the acquired tech. So uh, a serum ADA in tech should be normal, uh, but if it's something else, like Fanconi anemia, uh, then it's going to be uh, elevated. Uh, also, iron studies, uh, if you do perform them, uh, they'll be normal, but uh, with this CBC profile, there'd be no indications to get iron studies. You might get vitamin B12 and folate studies. Um, that would be normal, too. Uh, so in some cases, you can see a normal blastic anemia if you have uh, an iron deficiency anemia uh, in uh, coexisting with uh, B12 or folate anemia, but that's... Uh, it's a little more rare. Okay, so in most cases here, no treatment is necessary. Uh, this tends to self-resolve in about a month or two. If the patient has severe anemia, you can uh, do red blood cell transfusion, particularly if symptoms are present. But if more than one transfusion is necessary, you should entertain the possibility of a different diagnosis or consider that perhaps this baby has an immunodeficiency. Remember, that this often follows a viral infection. If there is an immunodeficiency, that viral infection can stick around a little longer and the tech can last a little longer too. Uh, so that's uh, the consideration. So if more than one transfusion is needed, you should start thinking about other things. Uh, but typically this resolves in a month or two. So this is diamond black fan anemia. This is one of those more nefarious congenital anemias uh, that I was referring to uh, where the ADA would be elevated, uh, unlike in tech. So this is also referred to as congenital hypoblastic anemia, and this typically arises during early infancy, uh, around three or four months of age. Uh, the anemic symptoms become apparent early on, uh, two, three, four, five, six months of age. Uh, in addition, uh, you can see congenital deformities that are associated with diamond black fan anemia, uh, but they're also associated with Fanconi anemia, so uh, it's a little bit difficult to distinguish just based on that. Uh, workup, as like for any patient who uh, is anemic, and typically any patient in general, you get a CBC. That's going to show a macrocytic anemia, just like tech. Uh, there also might be some neutropenia or some thrombocytosis. Uh, the reticulocyte count is going to be low, and that reflects the bone marrow origin of, of this pathology. The ADA here is going to be elevated. Now, that doesn't give you your diagnosis of diamond black fan, but it does differentiate it from tech, and tech is something that goes away on its own. Diamond black fan anemia is congenital, and it's not ever going to go away um, unless you do a, a stem cell uh, transplantation, bone marrow transplantation. Um, since you have a macrocytic anemia here, uh, it's worth it to get folate and B12 levels uh, because it is possible to have a deficiency. Um, that's usually going to be normal, although you know, it is possible to have a folate deficiency plus diamond black fan anemia, but typically this is normal. Parvovirus B19 can cause anemia, so you should always get a parvo B19 PCR. Um, that will be normal as well. And then the bone marrow biopsy will be done when you really have a strong suspicion of diamond black fan anemia, and this is what's going to give you your definitive diagnosis. Um, and it's also important for differentiating this from Fanconi anemia, which we're going to talk about next. Um, in the bone marrow biopsy, there'll be decreased red blood cell precursors, and this, what differentiates this from Fanconi's anemia, and this is important to know, you should write this down, in diamond black fan anemia, there's a normal chromosomal stability when uh, the, the uh, bone marrow or whatever they're, they're using is exposed to either diapoxybutane, uh, also known as DEB, or mitomycin C. Uh, so the chromosomes are stable. When we're talking about Fanconi anemia, it's the opposite. They're unstable. But otherwise, you'd have a very similar picture to diamond black fan anemia. So here's our differential. So 
Uh, in tech, you have a normal ADA, and then you recover spontaneously. So that's quite different. You also uh, usually have a normal blastic anemia, and there's typically no congenital malformations that you see in diamond black men. Uh, Parvo B19, red cell aplasia, that's not uncommon, uh, but in this you'll have a positive uh, parvovirus result. Fanconi's anemia is very similar to diamond black fan anemia clinically and lab-wise, but the big difference is going to be that the chromosomes that you get uh, when you get your bone marrow biopsy, the, those chromosomes are going to be uh, fragile uh, when they're exposed to uh, DEB or mitomycin C. There's a couple other ones that we're not really going to talk about uh, in this uh, in this lecture, but I figured we may as well graze it a little bit just because uh, even though they're rare, um, you can see them uh, clinically and you may read about them in the literature. Uh, so one is called Pearson syndrome. It's very similar to diamond black fan anemia, but there are a lot of other things wrong with these babies. Uh, they tend to have microcephaly. They have, tend to have small eyes. Uh, they have increased skin pigmentation, vitiligo. You'll see a lot of those things in Fanconi's anemia too. But this is uh, what really sets Pearson's uh, apart uh, from Fanconi's and diamond black fan. And that is these exocrine and endocrine insufficiencies of the pancreas, and that of course is going to lead to malabsorption and uh, type 1 diabetes. There's another one called Schwachmann Diamond Syndrome, probably named after the same guy that came up with diamond black fan anemia. That's very similar to Pearson's syndrome, but the, the difference is that that's genetically distinguished based on a specific mutation. You don't need to know these for the USMLE, but for literature purposes, now you know. How do we manage diamond black fan? Well, these patients should, of course, be referred to a specialist. Uh, typically, they're given uh, corticosteroids. That's really the uh, cornerstone of therapy for diamond black fan. But most hematologists don't recommend giving steroid therapy until around one year of age. Uh, so if there's any, uh, if there's any anemic, severe anemia symptoms uh, in these babies before, then usually you'll do a transfusion. Uh, but uh, starting at one year of age, you can start to do uh, steroids, either IV or oral. Uh, and then, as needed, you can give red blood cell transfusions. Typically, the target goal is to keep the hemoglobin above 9. And in diamond black fan anemia, there is an increased risk for osteosarcoma. So this is... Uh, some things that you can see in uh, the face, both of a person with uh, Fanconi's anemia and diamond black man. Uh, so wide separation of the eyes, the nose tends to be beaked-like in projection, and you can see an epicanthal fold, more so in, in, in this kid here. Uh, and then you see the abnormalities of the thumbs. Also short stature. I'm not sure how old this kid is, uh, but uh, this is apparently referencing the short stature. Here's some thumb anomalies. Uh, so uh, you can have uh, these thumbs that are kind of like appendages, just kind of hanging off. Uh, these are hypoplastic thumbs. And then uh, you can have also uh, thumbs like these, which look like other fingers. I forgot the name of the, uh, how, how they call this. Okay, so Fanconi's anemia, which we've been contrasting diamond black fan to, is similar. It's genetic. It's autosomal recessive, um, and uh, this has variable penetrance. So even uh, monozygotic twins, uh, one may have Fanconi anemia, the other one doesn't. So uh, it really just uh, depends on the individual. Uh, the marrow failure will occur sometime in the first decade of life. It can occur during infancy, but uh, but Unlike diamond black fan, it does not have to occur uh, early on during infancy. So that's one big difference there. Uh, if, if something that looks like diamond black fan presents on a four-year-old, it's not diamond black fan. It's going to be Pinconi. Uh, typically, this starts with thrombocytopenia, then it goes to leukopenia, then it goes to megaloblastic anemia. And in addition to the symptoms related to pancytopenia, manifestations can also include hyperpigmentation, cafe LA spots, vitiligo, short stature, limb anomalies, microcephaly, micropsia, epicanthal folds, um, similar to what you see in diamond black fan. Um, you can also get renal anomalies and cognitive deficits. So as we're working this up, 
you're going to have a similar picture to diamond black fan until you get that bone marrow biopsy. So CBC, you're going to have a macrocytic anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia. When you have all that, you, you get really concerned about some kind of leukemia process, especially when you're talking about a, a slightly older child, four, five, six years old. Um, also, you'll have an inappropriately low reticulocyte count. The ADA is going to be elevated, separating it from tech. Parvo B19 will be negative, folate and B12 should be normal, and then the bone marrow biopsy will be hypocellular, and this is of critical importance. The chromosomes are going to be fragile when they're exposed to DEB or mitomycin C. And that's really your diagnosis there for Fanconi's. So the differential is pretty similar to that with Diamond Black Fan. You have a pretty similar differential diagnosis. The management here is a little bit, uh, a little bit more involved because Fanconi's anemia has such a high uh, coincidence with, uh, with uh, leukemia and myel myelodysplastic syndromes. So uh, you'll want to get a CBC every one to three months. You want to get an annual bone marrow biopsy, and that's really looking for those myelodysplastic uh, syndromes and for uh, leukemia. In girls, they should get annual gynecologic screening starting at uh, menarche, and we're looking there for cervical cancer there, so getting uh, annual pap screens. Uh, HPV vaccine should be administered to all patients at, an appro at the appropriate age. And then, of course, uh, we're keeping vigilance here. Not only are we worried about anemia, or sorry, about leukemia and about myelodysplastic syndromes, but we're also concerned about tumors of the head and neck, of the esophagus, of the vulva, and of the cervix, and also of the anus. Um, these are primarily squamous cell carcinomas. Um, then uh, the only... Uh, definitive cure is a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So here's an example of some of those pigmentation abnormalities that you can see. Uh, so these are just CAF-ALA spots. And then this is uh, a young man here with uh, Fanconi anemia who is, uh, you can see this sort of more ruddy complexion, uh, some pigmented spots, and then this is also uh, indicating the uh, limb abnormalities. Cow's milk enterocolitis is something that is very commonly seen, uh, especially in uh, infants of new parents. You think, well, it's good to give my child milk. Milk is what we're supposed to drink. It's it does the body good, all that stuff that the, the milk lobby likes to put out there. Um, and it's true for adults, that's wonderful. Um, however, uh, you're not supposed to drink milk uh, if you're under one year of age. Um, the only milk that's okay for a baby that's under the age of one is human breast milk. Uh, not goat's milk, not cow's milk, only human breast milk. Uh, so cow's milk enterocolitis, it's called that way because it causes some GI symptoms, which ultimately is going to lead to uh, anemia if it goes on long enough. It's more commonly referred to, or more formally referred to, as cow's milk protein-induced enteropathy syndrome. So there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, foods, food products that can cause uh, these protein-induced enteropathy syndromes, but cow's milk is probably the most notorious. So cow's milk should never be given to a child under the age of one. After the age of one, it's fine to start whole milk, but under the age of one, uh, it should be avoided. Another thing that should be avoided under the age of one sort of unrelated, honey. So uh, cow's milk can cause enterocolitis. That can lead to occult blood in the stool. It's not going to be bright red blood parectum. It's not even necessarily going to be dark, tarry stools. It's usually going to be occult blood. Over a long period of time, though, this loss is going to cause anemia and it's going to cause iron deficiency. The iron deficiency can also happen because uh, the specific proteins in the cow's milk can reduce iron absorption. Uh, so you not only have anemia because you're losing blood, but because you're not absorbing iron, and that's really the two causes of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, cow's milk enterocolitis can also uh, upset the stomach, and it can lead to vomiting, and that vomiting can ultimately lead to dehydration as well. So you can see that there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. Anytime an infant has anemia, it's always, always, always important to ask the parent if they have been giving their infant cow's milk. So a baby under the age of one has anemia, 
you're going to do your CBC, you're going to do all your diagnostics, but the first thing you should do, ask the parent, have they been giving the baby cow's milk? Um, even if the cow's milk is not the cause, they shouldn't be giving the baby cow's milk, so they should be aware of this. Uh, if they say, no, I haven't been giving my baby cow's milk, then you can eliminate this. Uh, appropriate foods for infants include breast milk, infant formula, and age-appropriate baby food, which under the age of one years of age never includes milk. Not goat's milk or cow's milk. No kind of milk other than breast milk. So polycythemia is defined as a hematocrit of more than 65%. Uh, there's some specific populations who have a high incidence of this. So that's going to be babies who are small for gestational age, babies who are large for gestational age, and those tend to be the babies who are infants of diabetic mothers. Some other causes of this include placental insufficiency, so babies not getting enough uh, of mother's blood in the womb, the baby is going to ramp up their production, ramp up their EPO, and they're going to have uh, lots of their own red blood cells uh, in their circulation. Post-term delivery, uh, maternal smoking during pregnancy, and then of course the notorious twin-to-twin uh, -twin transfusion syndrome, which I'll show you a picture of that. The symptoms include plethora and readiness. That's probably the most obvious. Uh, symptom, but there can also be some CNS manifestations, typically what you see with hypocalcemia, so irritability, tremors, jitteriness, possibly seizures. There may also be some respiratory distress possible. Uh, priapism can be observed in male infants. It's a little bit uh, of a less common sign, but it may be there. And if the priapism is present, it should also alert you to another possible diagnosis, which would be sickle cell disease, and you can differentiate that on a smear. So this can lead to some really problematic, I'm sorry I misspelled problematic, <laughs> some really problematic complications. One of the big ones, especially in the babies who are small for gestational age or babies who are premature, uh, is going to be neck. Uh, about 40 to 45 percent of babies who have neck also happen to have polycythemia as well. Uh, so that can be a problem. And it can also lead to thrombosis, particularly renal vein thrombosis. Workup is going to be a CBC. You can diagnose this immediately based on your hematocrit. If it's 65%, that's going to be diagnostic. You should watch the platelets as long as the baby is in the hospital because polycythemia is a very rare cause of DIC. Uh, on your uh, metabolic profile, it's not uncommon to see hypoglycemia. That's actually the most common metabolic derangement in infants with uh, polycythemia, so you can correct that if necessary. You should get a bilirubin because remember, if you have extra red blood cells, there gets, there's going to be extra red, red blood cell degradation, and that can uh, that can lead to uh, too much bilirubin than the baby can process, and so that would lead to uh, an elevated indirect bilirubin. Uh, the serum calcium should also be drawn. Uh, calcium is probably the second most common metabolic derangement, and that's probably what leads to these CNS manifestations. Uh, so usually the calcium is going to be low and that uh, can be also that can also be corrected as necessary. And then you should also get uh, ABGs, particularly if the baby has respiratory distress and that can uh, help you discern the possible cause. And I'll, I'll just note here that respiratory distress can be both a cause and a result of polycythemia. So this is twin-to-twin uh, -twin transfusion syndrome. So you have two twins here. Um, one is polycythemic. The other one is relatively anemic. Uh, so just a little quiz here. Which of these babies is more likely to fare better, the polycythemic baby or the anemic baby? And the answer is actually the anemic baby. Anemia is associated with less problems. It's easier to treat. It's easier to fix than polycythemia. So uh, the baby that's getting more blood flow is actually slightly, less, uh, slightly more worse off. Management for polycythemia. So it depends on if they're asymptomatic or symptomatic. If they're asymptomatic, you can observe them. Uh, maybe overnight ad admission, uh, just get a serial hematocrit and glucose levels uh, every six hours. And then you just keep doing that until the hematocrit declines. Uh, 
Uh, if the hematocrit, though, happened to be 75% or more, and remember the diagnosis for polycythemia is 65% or more, but if it was 75% or more, uh, you can consider doing partial exchange transfusion even if there are no symptoms. And the partial exchange transfusion is what we're going to do for the symptomatic babies. So if the baby is symptomatic, we do partial exchange transfusion. Uh, we should also manage fluid, electrolyte, and glucose levels as necessary. We have to always make sure that we're covering our basics as well. So uh, with that, you can uh, leave any questions that you have uh, below.